All right, so thank you all for joining us. Um, my name is Rebecca Leopoldina Torres, and I'm currently serving as the president of the Monotype Guild of New England. And I'll be serving tonight as the moderator uh, for our Q&A later on. So and on behalf of the Guild, I just really wanna thank everyone for joining us tonight for our demonstration on uh, creating inks from natural materials with the great artist, Marjorie Morgan. Um, before we begin tonight, I just wanted to respectfully acknowledge the indigenous cultures of New England. As the Monotype Guild of New England is based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, we join you from the traditional and ancestral territory of the Massachusetts people and the Wapano tribe. And I would like to recognize them as the past, present, and future caretakers of this land. As this land has been a place that has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among nations, in that tradition, we look forward to our meeting and exchange tonight. Um, we have artists joining us from all over the US and beyond today. So if you get a moment to just drop a note um, in the Q&A button below and just let us know where you're coming from, we always love to hear where everyone is joining us from tonight. So whether you're joining from our webinar format via our live stream on YouTube or watching the recording at a later date, we're just grateful and happy that you're here with us tonight. Um, and so for those of you not familiar with the Monotype Guild of New England, uh, we are a volunteer run nonprofit printmaking organization consisting of over 250 contemporary artists that are creating unique impressions by working in the medium of monotype and monoprints. As a volunteer run artist organization, MG &E is currently funded primarily by our membership dues and donations. And so I wanna take a quick, quick moment to thank all of our members and volunteers who are helping to keep this organization not only running, but growing and thriving during these unprecedented times. Um, while our current exhibitions are on hold for the time being, we're actually excited to announce that we have a couple of three exhibitions actually lined up for the fall. So stay tuned, there should be some um, announcements over the next couple of weeks about those exhibitions. We also are launching a virtual exhibition on April 1st that around collaboration amongst our members. So if you get a chance, go to our website at mgme.org next week for more information. Um, so for a few points of logistics, we are using the webinar, form, webinar format in Zoom. So we invite you to submit questions via the Q&A box which you should be able to find usually at the bottom of your screen. Um, and if you're joining via YouTube, then feel free to drop your questions uh, in the comments and we'll respond to those as well. Um, after the presentation and demonstration ends, we'll devote a few minutes at the end for questions. So, you know, please feel free to ask questions. Um, we're just gonna hold them to the end. Um, so with all that housekeeping out of the way, I'm excited to get on with the show. So like all of you, I'm really excited to see how Marjorie makes beautiful, vibrant inks from natural materials. While we were stuck at home last year, um, I was really inspired by her Instagram posts on creating these beautiful prints using a pasta ro roller. And uh, I was also inspired by her uh, video tutorials on the ZMA's website. So I'm really excited to uh, see her do her thing tonight live. Um, and for those of you who are able to join us last month for our virtual tour of the pigment collection at the Harvard Art Museums, which is on our YouTube page, we're really excited to be able to follow up that deep dive into the history of pigments with something more practical tonight and showing you how do you, you can create these things at home. So designed for monotype and monoprint printmakers, tonight will events will combine um, art making with cooking and environmentalism to show the dynamic nature, nature of working with natural inks. In this demo, Marjorie will discuss the advantages of creating natural inks, show images of her artwork, and then demonstrate how to create inks, prepare plates, and print with them. The demo will include how to create two different inks at home and how to print with them using a press, a pasta roller, or no press at all. So I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker, uh, Marjorie Morgan. She's a painter and printmaker who grew up in Vermont and currently lives and works in Western Massachusetts. A member of the Oxbow Gallery and ZMA's printmaking, she has been completely captivated by the practice of making her own ink and pigments and using them in drawing, painting, and printmaking. So thank you, Marjorie, for sharing your passion and creativity with us tonight. And with that, I will hand the presentation over to you. Okay. Thank you, Becca. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining me. Um, in just a moment, I'll start a PowerPoint presentation and then we'll go through a bunch of material and then I'll demonstrate some inks right away. So I'm gonna go right into screen share and um, get this going. And start us out. Okay, so um, this first slide has a couple of um, 
different materials that I make inks from. I make inks from so many different things. And these, I'll talk a little bit later about um, the difference between dyes and pigments. But tonight we're gonna talk about creating inks from dye materials. So on the left is a picture of me creating some ink from onion skin. On the right are some beautiful grape hyacinth from last year that I turned into ink. And in the middle is a piece of artwork that I created uh, on a professional press, a large press um, with two different plates that had natural inks on them. So the general uh, plan for today, I'll talk to you about why I started creating my own inks and, and hopefully encourage you to do this as well. It's such a fun practice. I'll talk about the difference between dyes and pigments, which especially for those of you who did last month's um, webinar, that will be interesting to you too, to, to talk about dyes in context with pigments. I'll show some examples of artwork. Um, I will give you an explanation and show a couple of short videos about how to use natural inks with um, the watercolor technique. So creating monotypes with the watercolor technique. Um, do some safety and storage tips, and then we'll get into demonstration. And we'll save some time at the end for Q&A. So if you have questions as I go through the program today, um, put them into the Q&A or into the chat, and, and we'll hopefully have time. We'll definitely have time for questions at the end. Okay, so why I make my own inks. Um, this photo is a photo from the back porch of my house. I live in Coleraine, Massachusetts in Western Massachusetts. And this is from last April. So this is what we have to look forward to <laughs> soon, very soon. Um, and when I moved into this home, uh, the only place I had to clean up my art materials was a, a kitchen sink. And I was doing a lot of work with oil paints and, um, and inks, and I just didn't want to bring that into my kitchen. So I started investigating other ways of creating materials, and it was a lot of hit or miss. Um, and eventually I got into some, some real success. It took a little while, um, but that's why I started. Um, and so if you have a home studio, or even if you have a studio where you care about having less toxicity in your studio, it's a great practice. Um, I'm a little impatient as a person and creating my own materials has definitely helped me to be more patient and also to be more flexible that really I'll work with pretty much whatever nature is kind of opening out to me and the results can vary, which makes your art practice really exciting. Um, making your own materials from natural, making your own art materials from natural materials is so inexpensive. And especially if you're an artist who likes to work large, um, I really like making large prints and the cost of inks can just get ridiculous. And this is so inexpensive. You're basically using natural materials, water and a heat source and pretty much you're good to go with your inks. Uh, it's connected me to nature in a really beautiful way. So I really know the seasons and I know so many more plants in the area in which I live. And also when I travel, you know, during COVID, not so much, but um, normally when I travel, I also will forage and bring materials home and create ink from those. Uh, my palette has changed a lot. I used to be a very primary color painter and printmaker, and I'm heavily into the secondary and tertiary tones now, and I love that. Um, there's little to no waste. I have a compost bucket in my studio. I used to have a like a metal bucket that I would have to empty periodically and go to a hazardous waste station to get rid of my oil materials. And now I have a compost bucket and I love that. Um, it's sustainable, not using fossil fuels and little to no extractions. The only extractions that I use um, are pretty minor, dig maybe digging very just below the surface, hardly anything. And then it's really creative and fun. So hopefully you'll get a sense of that. So the explanation of dyes versus pigments, they, a lot of times people use the term pigment very generally to basically just talk about color. So in the, in the creative world of natural ink making, we do separate these out into two different categories. So dyes come from materials that are organic matter. They, these materials have carbon and they're harvested or foraged from the surface of the planet up. So really think about living matter, plants and things like that. Um, 
pigments come from inorganic matter. So they have little to no carbon and they're harvested from the surface down. So rocks, um, dirt, ochre, minerals, things like that. And these images that I put at the bottom of this um, page, the one on the left is actually ink that I made from grass. You can make ink from grass and leaves. And on the right is pigment that I foraged in the white um, mountains of New Hampshire and ground it down. Um, so pigments typically, I use pigments oftentimes to make paints. You can use them for printmaking as well. Um, so dyes also, they have a very small particle size and they're water soluble. So they bond with water instantly and they're typically not light fast. So they change over time. Um, pigments have a larger size, particle size, they're insoluble. So you can mix them, mix them with water and they'll still settle to the bottom and they're fairly light fast. So everything changes. It's just a matter of how quickly things change. If you're using dyes as material, your color will change more quickly than if you're using pigments, but pigments will change over time too. So it's important to kind of remember that. Um, and then dyes chemically bond with the materials and pigments physically bond. So what that means with, if you're working with pigment, you need to use some kind of binder to get it to, if you're working on paper, to get it to bind to the paper. The dyes um, will just become one with the paper. They really like to hang out with other materials and merge with them. So the inks that I'm gonna talk about today, I've made, I'm making with dyes. So just for that difference. Um, here are some samples of artwork. So this is a very small, this is probably about four by four monotype that I made with natural inks. These inks in this one are wild grape, pink hyacinth, coreopsis, um, and a little bit of acorn cap ink, just so you get a sense of how many things you can create inks with. These two pieces are quite large. They're also monotypes. The one on the left is about five feet tall. It's um, five feet by, um, I think about three feet. And the one on the right is about three feet tall. So they're large. Um, working on large plates is really fun. You can kind of get a sense of the flow and the fluidity of the inks in these. Um, the specific inks I use for these on the left, I use chokeberry, which is an ink I'm gonna make today. Um, wild grape looks like, oh, some avocado pit and skin and black walnut and um, goldenrod. And on the right, there's a lot of wild grape in the one on the right, especially if you harvest wild grapes early in the season, they give a beautiful burgundy, a rich burgundy tone. And then also chokeberry and onion skin and a little bit of acorn cap and that one on the right. Um, about maybe about a year or so ago, I started layering over these monotypes with pigments, with paints that I made from natural pigments. Um, one, because I wanted to find a little more structure in the artwork and form, and two, because I wanted to play with this idea of time and how quickly or slowly things change. So in this piece of artwork, the background what I see as like sky and cloud and maybe mountains and water are made from inks from dyes. And then over that I've layered with pigments. So the, the land masses and the horizon line and some of the water will change very, very slowly in this artwork. And the other elements will change more quickly. So you'll have sky and water that change where the land masses or change quickly and the land masses will change very slowly, which to me mirrors what happens naturally in the world anyway. Um, these two images uh, show you a little bit how the ink changes over time. And then also that layering technique I just talked about. So on the left is the image. This is almost entire, a little bit of black, no, a little bit of acorn cap in this, but it's mostly coreopsis ink and um, wild grape ink. And the, the image on the left I took right after I pulled this print and the image on the right is about a year later. So you can see how those, um, those inks have changed. The, the purple has changed in kind of, into kind of like a, a dusky lavender gray. And the most interesting thing to me is that that coreopsis, that's the orange that starts kind of yellow and tan and turns into this rich orange 
actually got deeper and more saturated with time. So it's important to know too that as things change, they don't always get lighter and fade out. Sometimes they get stronger. Um, and more recently I've started working with artist books um, and the inks are really fun and playful for that. So more, more of that in my future. If you follow me on Instagram, you've been watching me play around with artist books. Um, Okay, so let's talk about how to prepare a plate for this. So I work with PETG plates. I have worked with plexiglass, like kind of general tougher plexiglass, but the PETG is great. It's very flexible and very hardy. Um, the first thing you'll wanna do, and people who do watercolor technique do this anyway, whether they're working with natural inks or not, is you wanna rough up the surface with a little bit of um, sandpaper, a fine grained sandpaper. And that gives those inks something to kind of grab onto. Then you apply the ink and you can, I'll show a few different techniques tonight. I like to pour the ink. I can, I'll guide it with spoons, um, paintbrushes sometimes, not as often. And then I also really love playing with eyedroppers. They're, they're great for kind of painting and guiding the ink. Um, here is a little video of me. It's a time-lapse video. So I'm putting ink right onto the plate here. It's a little octopus that I made. Um, and I'll show it again and talk about the inks that I use. So that's a black walnut ink that I started with, and then into pokeberry, which is poisonous and beautiful. <laughs> and then last, hickory nut ink. So that is a plate that's prepared. Um, then what you would do with the plate that you've prepared is let it dry overnight. And you want it to dry overnight for a couple of reasons. Um, one is it will, if you don't dry them and you move it through a press, even if you're hand pressing, you'll just smush that ink right off the plate. Um, and you won't get those nice clean edges that some of us love in printmaking. So one is to give you nice clean edges. The other one is it protects any kind of um, blankets or felts that you might have on your press if, you, if you're working with a press. Um, and I have learned this the hard way. So I've definitely um, tried to press ones that are not fully dry. And even if it's a little bit, the roller will just push that ink right off the plate and it will, um, it will dye your felts. So. Um, a word of caution. So let it dry overnight. Then on the press, I start with the plate. The plate is on the bottom. Then I put dampened paper. So because the ink has been dried, you're going to rehydrate it very quickly with dampened paper. Over the dampened paper, I put a blotter, usually another piece of printmaking paper, um, and then the felts and blankets, and then print. And I'll show you. So I am here pulling a large print off of the plate, it's already been through the press. And I'll show you that again too. Um, one of the things that is great about this little video is it shows how good the release of these inks are. So there's hardly any ink left on the plate. And you'll see um, just kind of a line of sediment that I'm gonna, I'm gonna show it one more time. On the right hand side, you'll see a line of sediment left over and it's kind of in the middle of this print also, the, that sediment is, is from the inks and gives great, a great sense of texture. This piece of artwork is what came out of that print that I just showed being pulled. So again, I'm layering over these. This one has an ink wash on the bottom and then pigment painting on the sides and for the horizon line. So, and it's, you could see from the size of the, the print, it's fairly large. Um, some safety and storage tips. Label your inks with the contents and the dates. And you can see I showed you a little image of some acorn cap ink. I write where I shear road is where I live. <laughs> so I have that for reference. Um, so if I if I forage acorn caps from another site, I might compare and contrast what those, how those inks are different. And then I put the dates and you can see I have two dates there. I've actually mixed two different inks. So I freshened up my ink there in February. Um, you wanna add gum Arabic and or whole cloves to help preserve them. You don't have to do that if you don't mind if they go bad quickly. The gum Arabic is, um, is a natural preservative and it also can give a little bit of um, extra, uh, what heft I guess to it. It'll make it a little gummier and a little stickier. Um, 
And whole cloves really are a great preservative. I wasn't sure I'd read that and I was doing it and I thought, oh, I don't know if that really works. So I tried to make inks without it and they molded very quickly. So the whole cloves absolutely help, highly recommended. Um, when you're not using your inks, put them in a refrigerator. If you have space, I have a little mini fridge now in my studio and I have an image of that too. You can see all my inks hanging out in there. Um, don't drink your ink, even though they're made from natural materials, um, they're concentrated and they're not, your body's not really designed to process things that are quite that concentrated. And also if you've added gum Arabic, the body can't digest gum Arabic it, and it can really make your belly very unhappy. So don't drink it. And because of that, keep these dyes away from small children and pets. And there was a little debate online about a woman whose cat had drunk some of her ink and, sh and she had to take it to the vet. It was fine, but it's still, you just wanna be careful. Um, know the materials you're working with. So if you're out foraging, um, it's good to research what's going on in your, what things are growing in your area. You, there are a lot of apps that are plant and flower identifiers. My neighbors know so much about the plants around where I live. They've been a great resource. Um, so just know a little bit about what you're, what, what you're put, if you're foraging, what you're putting in your foraging bag. So I wouldn't just bring any, anything home. Um, be mindful of toxic materials. Pokeberry is poisonous. Elderberry is poisonous until it's been cooked. Um, and then a lot of ink makers, myself included, like to work with rust water and copper acetate or copper oxide. Um, and those materials are definitely toxic. So you, you wanna handle them with caution and be mindful of those. And then um, when you're foraging out there in nature, just also don't forget where you are and um, be careful of ticks, do any kind of tick prevention you need to do, watch out for poison ivy, um, you know, try not to trip on logs, <laughs> the usual stuff. Um, and here, this last slide before we get into demonstration is of, um, the beautiful aronia plant. So this is an image I took up in New Hampshire. And these are the flowers that then later become chokeberries. And I'm gonna make ink from chokeberries. And those are two um, prints that I made. They're actually quite large too from chokeberry. It's one of my favorite, favorite inks. Um, so we will head into the demonstration now and let me stop the share and there I am. Okay, all right. So ready to move on. I am going to shift over to my workstation. These are two um, prints that I decided to put up. I pulled these maybe just a couple weeks ago. Um, I made them at ZMA's printmaking and um, they, I wanted to put them up there because they're made with the inks that I'm gonna make tonight. So they're made with chokeberry ink and, um, and beet ink. So we're gonna work with chokeberry and beets tonight. Um, I have, the tools of my trade, I'm gonna put this on already. So a nice a hot, little hot plate that travels around with me um, and choke berries. And then for the beet ink, I'm gonna use a blender and some water. So I'm just gonna get started. So for berries, this is a very general recipe that works for berries. It also works for grapes. And for berries, you can use, um, choke berries are very rich because they're um, from the wild, but you can also use, um, commercial berries as well. Right now, if you have berries in your freezer, you can make ink from them. But the, the basic gist is this, you're gonna take berries and you're gonna put them in hot water and you're gonna get, and I can even show you, you can see it's already getting purple. They just love to make color. Um, and then you get a masher and you're gonna mash them up and then cook them down. And that's basically it. Some people ask me like, oh, how much water and do you measure? And I don't really measure. I just kind of wing it. I'm a monotype printer. So we like to be a little improvisational. Um, and, but if you want to, you can measure. You can always put things down. Um, and then I usually have little strips of paper, like a little tiny strip. And I usually use just little scraps of printmaking paper so that I can test the ink and see like already Look at this, there is the ink that you're getting already. It's bare, I preheated the water, but it's barely cooked. So I'm gonna let this cook down for a little bit more. And, uh, and we're gonna make some beet ink too. All right, I'm gonna put the blender over here, whoops. Okay, I also love working with an immersion blender, but 
to be honest, it's in use at my house tonight. So I'm, I have my other blender. So for beet ink, there are two ways you can do it. You can cook beets as well. And I do often do um, cooked beet ink, um, but I really like the fresh beet ink. And I just wanted to show you another way to make ink as well. So when you're working with um, vegetables, you can always grind them up. This works for grass. This works for carrots. This works for um, general leaves that, you, that maybe you wanna get some green out of. So I put the beets into my blender and I'm gonna add as little water as I can handle because I don't wanna dilute it too much. And we'll see if my blender's behaving. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna add a little more water, but I'm getting a really rich color already. It's so fun. <laughs> Blenders are great. This is my studio blender. Okay, and that's really, you can grind it up a lot, but you'll see I've already gotten a lot of juice from this. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of pour the pulp in there and I have always have a wooden spoon hanging out and I'm gonna press down onto the pulp and get. Um, there's my beet ink. So here is that already nice and dark and I'll use a little test strip. And you can see this gorgeous color. That's it, that's all it takes. Now, the other thing, I talked about this in the PowerPoint demonstration, things to add. So um, I label my jars, like this is actually some cooked beet ink that I made a little while ago. Um, so I always label it and I put a little bit of gum arabic and some whole cloves. Um, just, it depends on how much you've made. I do recommend, unless you're doing big plates, that you, you start small and you make like small amounts because it doesn't last. Um, and you just kind of want to try it and see how it's going. So like just a little bit of gum arabic and then swirl that around a little bit. And this should, this will last for, I would say at least a few weeks, maybe longer. Um, it varies how long things last. The nut inks last a very long time. Like I have black walnut ink that is probably over two years old. That's still going strong. Um, and then a, a whole clove or two in there and you're good to go with this. Maybe we'll even use this to, to prep a plate. So the choker ink, I'll see how it's doing. It is, it's cooking away. It's very happy. And yeah, it's making, this is another great thing to see. Um, so here is the chokeberry ink. And this is that little test strip that I did not too long ago. So it changes with exposure to oxygen. So it oxidizes and turns from purple to blue. Um, also the paper that you use will impact, again, these chemically bond with the materials that they're involved with. So, you know, as you know, as printmakers, every paper that you use is a little bit different and the sizing in the paper is gonna impact it. Um, all sorts of things are gonna, if it's cotton, if it's like what the paper is made out of. So um, it's good to have little samples from different things if you want consistent results, or you can just wing it and be open to what happens. So I'm gonna let the choker ink keep going and I'm gonna move this blender back and I'll show you how to prep a plate. We'll look, we'll look at a few different versions. So this is just a big sheet of plexiglass here. Let me put this down more. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do, get a little bit of sandpaper and you're gonna rough up your plate. This gives it, something to cling on to, okay? And when I work with small plates, um, I often will use eyedroppers. I love working with eyedroppers. And let's use this beet ink that we just made. So I'm gonna fill it up. And um, you know, you saw on that little slide that I showed you, you can really just kind of create whatever whatever, so this is the little shape that I just did there. And if I'm happy with that, I'll just leave it and let it dry overnight. Um, 
Another thing that you'll notice, we'll see how it is with this big plate. I'm in somebody else's studio now because I live in a town that has no broadband. So I don't have Wi-Fi at home. So um, this table I've not worked on before to create plates. Um, you will notice right away if your surface is level because you're working with these watery substances. So let's just see. Um, this one I've already prepped and I, I check which side has been roughed up. So this side has been roughed up. And for this one, let's do, I'll do a little chokeberry that I made ahead of time. Let me turn this off too. This ink is ready. So the chokeberry ink, once it's cooled, I'll add gum arabic um, and some cloves. You could probably put the gum arabic even when it's hot, but I just wait for it to cool a little bit. Um, so I'm going to take some chokeberry ink that was previously made. And when I'm working with a larger plate, I like to pour right on the plate. And you can do a whole bunch and automatically you get some kind of shape. If you um, are working with something that's not toxic, feel free to move this around with your hands. Certain things, certain inks are gonna have a higher sugar content. So like the ones that I'm working with tonight, beet and chokeberry have a higher sugar content. If you have areas that are very thick, um, when you're trying to pull your print, they might tear at the paper a little bit. So if it's very heavy, sometimes I'll take a rag as after I poured it down and really just soak up some of that ink. If I like the shape, but I feel like, oh, there's a little too much ink there, I'm going to just pull some of it right up. Um, I also, I brought a little onion skin ink too, just for a little variety. Um, I like to use spoons as well. So I have big spoons and little spoons, but you can take a little bit of the ink and the spoon and also move that around. Now I'm gonna see if I can, let me see if I can get this a little closer. Um, the inks are beautiful as they move. Let's see how can I do this? You can probably see a little bit, but if you start pouring them over each other, they will, you can see that a little bit. They create some gorgeous shapes. I'm gonna even move my computer so you can kind of see what's happening there. So you're getting this interplay between those inks and, um, and it feels a lot like painting to me, that process. Um, so again, if I'm happy with this, I'm gonna set this aside and let it completely dry overnight, yeah? So this magical thing is gonna move out of the way. And I have some plates that I prepared ahead of time. I'm like Julia Childs. I prepare dishes ahead of time and then my magical studio changes. Um, so I'll show you how to, you saw in the video how it works with the press. So when you're working with the press, if I even, I do print, do little ones on presses. So I would put the plate down on the press. I would put dampened paper over that and then a blotter and then the felts and I'd run it through the press. Um, if I'm doing it at home and I don't have a press at home, I can do hand printing or a pasta press. So I'll do a hand printed one. So I pre dampened this paper. This is Stonehenge. Um, when I'm working on large prints, the ones that I showed you earlier, these ones back here, those are on Zirkel. It's a lithography paper. It's my favorite paper for doing larger prints. If I'm doing little ones at home, I tend to use Stonehenge. It's inexpensive and it's kind of fun to play with. So I'll take out this. Um, and when you did, so I dampened this just a few hours ago, put it in a plastic bag. You can tell that it's kind of ready to go if it feels cool, but not wet. So you don't want it to have like big wet marks. If it's wet, you just um, tamp it down with a little bit of towel and then it should be okay, but cool is good. So this, I'm just gonna do a little hand press one. So I'll take my plate, I'm gonna put it on the paper and you can see there is this little thing and I'm gonna flip it over and I use a plastic scraper. This is just like from a hardware store. And then I'm gonna press down on the plate a few times. You're not gonna get the same kind of release that you would with the roller because um, you know, hand printing is hand printing and it's fun. It can give you different kinds of textures, but actually that came out pretty good. So here's that little print. That is with beet and chokeberry. So the pink is the beet and those little chunky 
areas are the chokeberry and you can see the wonderful textures that you get with the sediment. So some natural ink makers will, um, they'll filter their ink. And that's really if you're using your ink in some kind of writing implement, but, or if you don't want any sediment at all. I love the sediment. I love the textures that it gives. Um, so now let's do one with the pasta press. So here's my pasta press that moves into focus. And I'll print this little, here's another little one I prepared with beet and chokeberry. I'll take one of my pre-dampened pieces of Stonehenge out, make sure it's not overly wet, cool but not wet. I place this on here. So here we have that. And then I'm gonna get my crank into the pasta machine. My pasta roller is very little. Some people have ones that are bigger. So I slide it in here and then I can just start cranking. So I can't even get it all the way through. Um, I have to flip it halfway through. Um, I had a lot of fun. Becca talked about looking at some of my videos. My pasta press kept me sane in those early days of COVID because I, you know, ZMAs was closed down. I really missed printmaking. And I'd read, I'd read about it. Somebody had posted something about it. And I said, how do you do it? And they never responded. So I was like, I'm just going to figure it out. So here is this little print. It makes a nice little print. I, I just put my pasta press on the tightest um, setting and no blankets, no nothing, just really the paper and the metal of that. And then I thought it would be fun, here it is, to layer one over. So this is a print, I call them pasta prints. This is a pasta print that I did, I don't know, sometime in the last year. And I rehydrated it. So I, I made this damp and I put it in a separate bag because they'll bleed a little bit if you, you know, the ones you've done before. And I thought it'd be fun to just like show a double printing. So a lot of times I'll layer the prints over. When you rehydrate something that you've made from natural inks, most likely the colors will change. Just that process of rehydrating, um, you've already released a lot of the sizing in the paper. And um, so you won't have the same chemical response that you had the first time around. So I'm gonna stick this in here and get that to go through. That's pretty fun. And I'm gonna turn it. And you know, you can see the release is so good on these. So now here is my combo print. Yeah, so fun. Um, let's see, I think that's most of the stuff I wanted to do. Let's see what time it is. Oh, that's good timing. Um, I think let's chat a little bit now. I think that's good. Yeah. So, and I can't hear anybody else. So, yeah. Thank you so, so much. Um, I, we have lots of questions. So, we have lots, lots to uh, chat about. Um, so, some of the first category questions is around uh, what you can make inks out of. Um, so it was a question around those of us who live in more urban environments. So we were forging a little differently um, about using like grasses or other materials. Would that be something that you could make ink out of? Absolutely. So to make, and to make grass is one of the easiest inks that you can make. So to, to make grass ink and you, I haven't done it with grass. That's like brown that some of us have around right now, but you could definitely try it. Um, you're going to do the same way I showed the ink that was made from beets tonight. So you're gonna put them in a blender, um, add a little bit of water, grind the ink uh, from grass, I grind up pretty well. Like I really go at it, like I'm making a smoothie. Um, and then strain it out, add a little gum arabic, add some cloves and you're good to go. And bizarrely enough, I would have thought that like ink from grass would go bad quickly. I have a grass ink, obviously it's not recent. If you looked out here, all the grass is brown where I live. Um, it's from last September and it's still green. It's in my refrigerator, but I printed with it recently and it was green. And the other thing is some of these, um, you know, you saw from the slides early on, some of the berry inks change to graze over time. The, 
the green from the grass that I've made prints with, it has not changed. It's just holding steady as green, which just su surprises me. So it's whoever are scientists on you, among you, you can explain to me why. But um, so grass is a great thing to make from urban areas um, and, and leaves too, you know? And, and I would say like with, with anything, if you're um, hankering after something that's in somebody else's yard, always good to ask, right? Um, <laughs> But there are lots of parks in urban areas, so there should be plenty to work with. There even was, um, oh, I wanted to share a couple resources. This is a great book. Um, if you're interested in making your own inks, this guy totally got me from a lot of failure to a lot of success because he works on paper. And a lot of people who are making um, inks from dyes are working on fabric, they're textile artists. Um, so um, Jason Logan's great. And he talked about doing like a challenge with, um, with his kids and just going out on a walk and they were making ink from like cigarette butts and just all sorts of things. Um, another book to show quickly is this book. This is called Wild Color. This is a great resource in particular if you wanna make inks from flowers. Um, so uh, this one is geared for textiles. So um, yarns and fabrics, but it can be a little bit of a helpful guide in terms of how to get color from different flowers. So this has been really helpful too. Oh, great. Um, Okay. So yes, make grass ink, make ink from grass, do it. It's fun. All right. I will do it the second we start growing some new grass outside. Exactly. Um, also, there's a question around uh, how you make, because you had the onion skin uh, ink. How, is it the similar process? So the onion skin, you're just going to use the, on, the edges of the onion, the onion skin, and you can use, you can do it with red onions and you can do it with yellow onions. Same process. The onion skin is different than the inks that I showed tonight because it doesn't have, you're not cooking the fleshy part of, um, of the material. So it's going to be a very thin ink. So when I, I, and I showed you actually a little bit of onion skin tonight, it goes on very watery. With onion skin, you can boil it way down. So you can really get it to be a little more saturated and it will, it will give you a hue and the yellow skins will give you something between, depending upon how far you boil it down, um, like a light tan to a pretty rich orange. So it can make a really, really nice orange. And then the red onion skins make a reddish color. Make a, and, and again, you feel free to boil it down. And if you boil it too long, you'll know, like I've definitely overcooked some of my, when I've done cooked beet ink, um, cooked it till it's brown, you know? So then you have brown ink and maybe that's what you want. Maybe you don't, but then you learn that way. So it's, it's totally okay to, you're not probably going to harm anybody by overcooking your ink. You might just not get the color you want. Yeah. Right. Skin skin, you can boil way down. Yeah. Um, there are some questions around the materials you use. So we'll jump into that category. Yeah. So someone was asking what a PETG plate is. PETG is a kind of plexiglass. It's a um, and it's, there are a lot of different varieties of it. So it's actually used a lot in um, like, grocery, like food containers and things like that. It's a very flexible, but durable kind of plastic. And um, you can get it through printmaking supply things. Like I know that Akua sells PETG plates. You can get those online. Um, and then you can also search online. There are some commercial companies that will sell you large plates. So I get mine through ZMA's printmaking because they buy the large ones and cut them down. Um, but I have used other kinds of plexiglass and um, you're putting a lot of pressure on it over and over and over with a press if you're using a professional press. Um, and some of the plexiglass I've worked with has started to crack um, and it can, and then it can break and actually be kind of dangerous. So PETG is this, I can show you, oops, no, I can't because I printed, I put ink all over it, <laughs> but it's very, it's the, a very flexible plastic and the, they go on and on. And I have to say, I have yet to throw out a piece. Like they just, I'm basically keep cutting them down or altering them. Um, so it's, I, I really like working with it. It's a great surface. So that's, that's good. I've had so many plexiglass plates crack and break on me. So it's that's terrifying too. Like they're sharp and dangerous. Mm -hmm. So I definitely recommend PETG. Yeah. Great. Um, Bonnie is asking, are there certain papers that are better suited for this type of printing um, weight surface, et cetera, when, you know, that when you're using dyes? Absolutely. So, you know, if I'm hand pressing, Stonehenge is just fine. If I'm doing larger prints, 
um, I'm asking the paper to absorb and kind of bond with a lot more ink. So I'm gonna use um, a hardier paper than Stonehenge. I mentioned Zirkel is a lithography paper. It's spelled Z-E-R-K-A-L-L, -L, pretty sure. Um, and then I, I really like Pesha, um, which is an Italian paper. And I think that's spelled P-E-S-C-I-A, maybe, I think so. Um, and they recently changed their formula. So I haven't been able to find it unless I buy a pack of like 200 sheets. So if you want to go in on Pesha with me, <laughs> yeah, we can buy a big pack together. Pesha is beautiful paper. It's very hardy, but it also has a really good, um, a, a good plate release and, and really beautiful colors. Um, and then I also do, um, uh, I can never remember if it's Reeve BFK or BFK Reeve. Which way does it go? Do you know, Becca? BFK Reeves, I believe. Okay. Um, it's, it's, so it's, I use that too. When I'm doing some of the prints I've done are really, really big and you can get very big sheets of that. Um, so those are, the, those are the basic papers that I use. Great. Um, going back to the plexiglass, we had more questions in about that. Yeah. Um, there's questions around what is the thickness of the PT, PET replace, or can you order them in different things? Uh, you can order them. In if you're going through like a larger commercial company, they'll give you different options. Honestly, I don't know exactly how thick this is, but it's the same kind that Akua sells. So you could probably look up and see what the thickness is. And then if you're wanting larger sheets, the sheets that they sell are usually like um, they mostly eight by 10. Um, they probably have some bigger ones. And also if you, um, if you're not finding the information you need, I can hunt it down through ZMAs. So feel free to contact me. Um, I think we have contact information, right? Yes. Uh, and your website is what? Again? My website is marjoriemorgan.net. That's easy to remember. And my email's on that. And I'm also on Instagram under at margeart, M-A-R-J-A-R-T. And my uh, website's listed there. Maybe my email is too, I don't know. But yeah, like reach out and just say, oh, I can't find the kind of plate I'm looking for. Can you help me? And I'm happy to help you. Yeah. Great. Yeah, there's a question here about how one cuts plexiglass. Um, and I'm assuming it's like glass cutting. Usually you have it done professionally. I have it. Actually, ZMAs has a plate cutter. And it looks like a paper cutter, but it has this amazing thing that clamps down on the plastic as you're cutting. So nothing slides. Like that's the danger with plastic is that you could try it with, um, you know, you could try it, but it's slippery and you don't want to like cut wrong and you don't want to hurt yourself. So, um, so I use their plate cutter. Um, and if you don't, if there's nothing like that around you, I don't know. You know yeah, for anyone who lives in the Boston area, Framers Workshop is a really great resource. You could rent out space to frame with, but they also will cut your stuff for free. That's a great idea. Yeah, so Framers, or maybe I bet even places that cut glass would be willing to cut plexiglass for you. Um, so any like glass repair, you know, car glass repair service, and they'll have the tools that would help you to do that. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's great advice. I know we're all trying to be resourceful these days. Yeah, definitely. Um, Okay, let me see. And then finally, there's a question about, um, from Bobby Salt House, about when you work with the press, do you use newsprint as your blotter or do you actually just, do you use blotter paper? I do not use newsprint, it's just too thin. So um, let me see if I have an AV. Oh yeah, so you can see a little bit. This is one, this is a little print that I did as a, a tryout a couple days ago and the ink was kind of thick. And you can see that it is actually bleeding through the paper on the other side. Um, newsprint's not going to protect your felts against that. It's just going to go right through the newsprint. Um, so you want to use something hardier. So I often will use a BFK Reeve or lately I've been using Hanamule as a blotter. Mm -hmm. And that's been really helpful too. Um, basically any, and then the other thing is like, um, use it more than once, you know, you don't, paper's expensive, right? So I use them over and over and over and over and over again. And I often, if I'm doing a lot of printing, I'll have two different blotting papers. So because one will probably pick up a little bit of that extra ink from the first print and then I'll set it aside and let it dry. And then I'll use the other because if you keep, if it's still wet when you're printing, it may come through onto your print or also onto the felts. And then when I've done 
things that I know I really shouldn't do on a press, like I'm experimenting a little bit, I'll just even get out some plastic and just yeah. put it over what I'm doing. Just, you know, um, if, if you're in a shared facility, you just really want to be good to the, you know, to all those beautiful felts. So um, <laughs> pla plastic's fine over it. So if you don't have other paper, you could just um, put down some newsprint and some plastic and that would do the same thing. We just want to protect the things. Yeah. Yeah, that's really great, great advice. I know I use some wax paper when I'm, especially if I'm in shared facilities, I just- yeah, Wax use, paper's a great idea. And I use it to wrap after, so try yeah. to reuse it. Um, great, so we have some questions around, well, fading, but we'll get to that. Yeah. Um, there's a question around, have you ever used transparent base with your ink so you can roll them on or any sort of thickener? I have used, well, here's the thing. When you're, when you're working with dyes, they don't mix with transparent base because they're water-based, right? So they will not really, they, you can try and I have a little bit, but they don't really like that. So when I've wanted to create um, like a rolling ink to use a brayer with, with, um, with inks, what I do instead of, um, I make nori paste with, uh, with ink instead of water. So I use um, rice flour and then I add the ink that I've already created and heat that up and that will create a paste and you can use that. Um, that's, the, that's the best way that I've come up with so far. You could also try guar gum, which I've started to experiment with and gum chanescent, um, I've also been experimenting with. Um, I find that the best, if you're, if you're really wanting to use brayer and use those kind of techniques, um, pigments actually mix with transparent base beautifully. So earlier on, I talked about, you know, I had that rock that I ground up and you make a fine dust, wear a mask with the pigments, um, but you can mix a pigment right in with transparent base and they can make some gorgeous, gorgeous ink. So I often will do that as well. And those are fun to layer over these kind of prints that you've done with a uh, watercolor technique. So you can use them um, together. Yeah. That's, that's a really fun. Um, yeah, so then leading to a lot of questions around, well, there's a question around, do you ever use mordants on your paper before you print? Um, I, no, <laughs> <laughs> I don't, um, not for printing. I do for, or printing in this way. I use mordants when I am making eco prints, um, which is a whole different, that's a whole, whole different process. So I use mordants for that. I don't use them for this. Um, I do, I forgot to mention this too. I do sometimes, this is not so much about the mordant thing, but more about preservation of color and helping things to last. I do use this quite a bit. So this is an na all natural fixative, um, so called Spectrafix, and you can get this online. And, um, you know, it's non aerosol, it's all natural, and it can help your things last a, a little bit longer. So I'm less paranoid. I, when I first started doing this, I was spraying things like crazy because I just didn't want them to change. Um, but now I'm very open to them changing. So I, I don't do it as much, but I still, every once in a while, I do it. Um, but yeah, mordants only really with eco prints. But, and also I found that the mordants that you would use typically, the mordants that I tend to use are rust water and copper oxide or copper acetate. And those do not have very good release in my experience so far. I know there are artists who really work a lot with rust as an ink, um, but when I experimented with that, I had to use all sorts of extra release agents on them. And then I just was like, why am I making natural materials if I'm buying all these things to help them? So um, I just steered away from that. But I, I think you could experiment with it and see what happens, why not? Right, the heart of a monotypist, right? Yeah. <laughs> Mono printer. Right. Um, and that's a great transition because there's a lot of questions about color fasting and you know how you can prevent fading or archival aspect of, of the kind of prints you do. And I know we talked a little bit about this before uh, we joined tonight about like you know embracing the fact that these will change. Can you talk a little bit more, uh, more sure. about that? Yeah, so if you're, you know, if you want to work with natural materials, um, you do kind of have to embrace change, don't we all, right, in life anyway? Um, and you can think about it, change as like a spectrum that some things will change very quickly and th some things will change very slowly. Um, the things that are made from dyes, the inks that are made from dyes are going to change more quickly. But as I showed in one of those slides, 
they don't always change the way you might expect. They don't always um, get lighter, you know, or turn to gray. Sometimes they get richer. Um, so it's just basically they're, when you're making a print from natural materials, you're kind of uh, catching a moment in the life of that material. And then it's gonna keep changing after that moment, right? You've captured, and that's why it's good to photograph things too. You capture that moment and then they're gonna change and how they're gonna change has depends on so many different factors. It depends on the plant that you've used. It depends on the water that you've cooked it in. It depends on the temperature that it's being stored in. It depends on if it's out in the open air or if it's being stored away. It depends on, um, you know, the basic climate that you're in. Are you in an area that has a lot of salty, moist air? Like there's so many factors. Um, if you really want to make material, make art from materials that change very slowly, then pigments is the way to go. So pigments are don't have that same amount of carbon in them. And so they change very, very slowly. Like I, when Beck and I were talking about this yesterday, some of the, or two days ago, some of the pigments that I work with, you know, they're millions of years old. They're their color is changing so, so slowly that they will definitely outlast you. Um, these dyes might not, but you know, some of the, the black walnut ink, some of the black walnut might outlet, outlive me. Um, and I don't know how long I'm going to live anyway, so um, who, who knows how long that is. But um, change is just, it's part of the process, and it's terrified me at the beginning, and now I embrace it. Um, one of the images that I showed you, it was the, lar the large print that I pulled, and then I showed you I had kind of created it into a landscape. That one, I keep repainting the bottom of it. So it changes, and then I do another ink wash. And then I let it kind of hang out for a month or two. And then I do another ink wash. So I'm, I'm really starting to embrace the change and I keep painting over things or printing over them. Um, so it just, it depends on what you like and how open you are to that. But I, I encourage you to play with it really. Um, yeah. Well, and the I, question here, when you sell your work, do you give that warning to people who buy your work? Absolutely. Then? Absolutely. Um, so I, I do give the warning and I tell them like, if they, you want to be careful about where you put it. So if you want it to last longer, make sure it's not in a place that has direct sunlight. If you put it behind, if you frame it and protect it, it's going to last longer. Um, but I always let them know that. And because of that, I do price my work a little bit lower. Um, because I know that it's not, it's not that archival thing that we're kind of have gotten used to in the art world. Um, and then I've also, for some people that have bought work, um, I've told them that if it starts changing in a way that kind of scares them or freak them out, they should send it back to me and I'll make, I'll add some things to it um, and perk it up for them. So that's um, fun. I, I, I love that idea. And it, it kind of ties right into the envir environmentalism, you know, component of the idea that, you know, um, everything has a season and it's always changing, so. Absolutely, it's, and, I, and you know, you can compost through these too. Like uh, how many of us need all the artwork that we've made, honestly, really, you know? So we don't, we really don't need that much, um, but so, but it's up to you, you know, it's a personal preference for sure. Yeah. Great, well, I think that's a great way to end our talk for tonight. Thank you so, so much for giving this demo. Um, I've been hoping to do this for a while. So I'm hoping everyone goes out there and gets their pasta presses and they start making dyes out of stuff they find in the refrigerator. I think that'll Absolutely. be fun. And, and then out in nature soon because spring mm -hmm. is here. So mm -hmm. spring is here. So yeah, if anyone, you know, gets out and starts experimenting, I encourage you to post it to Instagram or you post on social media, just tag us at monotype guild NE or um, tag Marjorie. We love to see what you guys are producing. Um, and also the hashtag Ingenie at home is a good one to use and or email us. We love, we love to hear from you guys. So thank you all for joining us tonight. Tonight, Thank you, Marjorie. And thank hopefully we'll hopefully. see you again soon in person. Hopefully soon. <laughs> hopefully soon. All right. Bye everybody. Good night.